Pembroke Pines. Pastor Jerry Gore from the Pentecostal Church of God in Christ in Stewart. Rabbi Matthew Durbin from Temple Bay Kayam. Eating. And Father Christian Anderson from St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Stewart. And Darcy Weir. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Several of you have asked why I have not been pestering Pastor Gore and Father Christian with a lot of questions. The simple answer is that they are our two representatives of the Christian faith, and the Christian scriptures don't mandate any particular rules regarding food, except for communion, which we talked about last week. In fact, I'm told in a number of passages in scripture that no food is forbidden. God made it all, and all of it is good for us to eat. The same is true of our holy days. Christmas, Easter, Passover, in the Christian scriptures, there's nothing about what foods are to be eaten or any instruction about how to celebrate those days. Yes, some denominations practice fasting in the lead up to Easter, a period called Lent, and it's thought that that might have begun in the fourth century AD, but it isn't in the scriptures. Certain denominations, like the Seventh-day Adventists, follow dietary restrictions much like those of the Jewish and the Islamic traditions. Uh-oh, I think I may have parked there. Oh, Lord. I think I may have parked there. Just for those that may have parked at the Athena um, plastic surgeon um, parking lot, if, if and, and I hate to put this on hold right now, but if you could just please move your car to the back of, say, Blake Library or anywhere else. Um, just they have a lot of patients that cannot get out and can get in, um, and it's quite, you know quite it like? uh, disruptive for them. They're going to tow. And they will tow. They're going to tow in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. Tow your car in 10 minutes if you don't move it. Right next door. If you're parked in the medical lot, they're going to tow your car in 10 minutes. So if you park anywhere in the medical buildings, not over at Blake Library, they will tow your car in 10 minutes. Reddish, maroonish body. Over, I think it's in that med spot. And usually, it'll open up just by the proximity of the key. Thank you. Well, that's an interesting development. <laughs> All right, resuming. I was talking about the Seventh-day Adventists, and they do have similar food restrictions, but really there aren't scriptures governing food, food holidays, food festivals, and so forth. I've talked with Pastor Gore and Father Christian, and neither one is offended or feels left out. So set your hearts at rest. Last week, we were covering the special festivals and fasts observed by the three Abrahamic faith traditions, and we stopped just short of the last two, <coughs> one Islamic and one Jewish. Sheikh Shafayet, I was fascinated to learn about the festival which is most sacred to Muslims, the Eid al-Adha, otherwise known as the Feast of Sacrifice. Jews and Christians alike are familiar with the story of Abraham, who is called upon by God to ascend Mount Moriah and there sacrifice his son. Now it's worth remembering that Mount Moriah is a very special spot. It later would become known as the Temple Mount, the site of both King Solomon's and King Herod's temple. And today it's the location of the Wailing Wall, as well as the Dome of the Rock, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So it's a very holy site. Sheikh, you reminded us two weeks ago that in the end, instead of Abraham having to sacrifice his son, a ram was sent by God at the last moment to take the place 
of his son as a sacrifice. What was a surprise to me was that, according to the Quran, it wasn't Abraham's secondborn son, Isaac, born of Sarah, who was about to be sacrificed, as I had always read in the Hebrew scriptures, but his firstborn son, Ishmael, born of Hagar, who in the Hebrew scriptures is described as the Egyptian slave and maid servant of Sarah, Abraham's wife, but whom the Muslim scriptures describe as a high-born Egyptian princess given to Abraham to be his bride by an Egyptian king. So you have to tell us the inside story, the real story about the Eid <coughs> al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice, how you celebrate it, its significance, and how do you break bread in it? So basically, um, the more or less, I think, and I suppose we'll confirm when we hear from Rabbi, more or less the, the very same um, perspective of Abraham being called upon to sacrifice his son Isaac is the same reason why we believe that he was called upon to sacrifice his son Ishmael. But as you already explained, so I'm not going to repeat that. It, that's the, the theological difference where we say it's Ishmael and um, Judaism and Christianity says it's Isaac. But we believe that this happened in Mecca because ah. it was the first son with Hagar who was in Mecca. Ah. Yeah. And um, the sheep, the ram, because Abraham passed the test, that he was called upon to see if he was willing to sacrifice, this is the Islamic perspective, what is most dear to him? You know, what is most dear to him? It's like how nowadays money is most dear to a lot of people, so when they're called upon to give charity, it's sort of a little difficult. <coughs> because that's what we love the most. So more or less I'm using that example because that is what it was like. Islam tells us that this son was the son all people's son in general, the, your, your, your wealth, your, your, the inheritors of your wealth, those who will continue your progeny, um, your legacy, mm. your business, and the whole nine yards. So he was his productivity in looking at the future. So was Abraham going to say, no, 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 I love my son. I prayed for him for so many years at this age of 83 years because we believe this son came at the age of 83 uh, I suppose Isaac would have come maybe 12, 13 years after that. So all this sacrifice, and here comes God telling you to sacrifice, I mean, to slaughter what you have been going through years of sacrifice and prayer for. So that was the test, to see if he, was, if he would have that faith that God gave him the son, and God can still give him many more sons. Mm. And if he was not going to do the sacrifice, then that would have been his big trial. So he filled it, fulfilled the test. <coughs> as in Judaism and Islam, they are about to sacrifice the son uh, to s for the pleasure of God. Uh, to see, but, but God in as the Quran, faith, at the Quran, yes, in the Quran it says that God did not want blood and flesh. God was just testing his mm. faith. So it's not about slaughtering and and, 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 right. and and butchering him. It was all about testing his faith. And just as about he was, just as he was about to do it, the angel came with the ram and said. Well, two things. Some people say gave him that to sacrifice. But we say no. Gave him that as a celebration mm. to commemorate his success uh -huh. in graduating the, in the pleasure of God. That he has pleased God with his heart, his intention. So God was only testing him. So God says celebrate. Ah. Eat and drink and enjoy. It's because the command was not really to sacrifice the ram. Okay. Uh, sacrifice Ishmael. It was all about testing his faith. You see, the sacrifice was about his faith. And now he got... <laughs> so now the ram was about not a, 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 a replacement of Ishmael, but it was a celebration and a award, a, a gift, a reward. Go and eat and celebrate. Okay, now that I was the whole purpose. I'm going to turn to the rabbi because I've heard from you that there is a midrash that has a very equitable, almost Solomonic interpretation of this story. So 
Uh, Darcy, as you, as you mentioned, right, just so we're clear on, on terminology, midrash are the stories or the parables that the rabbis created 1,500, 1,800 years ago to fill in the biblical gaps. This is one of them. And the story goes, because if we read Genesis 22, the, the narrative does not give us very much information. It says, and God spoke to Abraham and said, take your son, your favorite son, the one you love, take Isaac. So a midrash comes forward and says that God says to Abraham, go take your son. And Abraham responds and says, but God, I have two sons. God says, okay, take your favorite son. Abraham responds, but God, I have two sons. They both are my favorite. He says, take the one you love. He says, God, I have two sons. They're both my favorite. I love them equally. And finally, God says, okay, take Isaac. Now, the story itself, as Sheikh has mentioned, was it was about a test of faith, right? How far will you be willing to go? How much will you put your faith in God? There's another Midrashic story that actually says that when the world was created, there were seven elements in the world that already existed before God could create them. One of them was the white ram. The white ram was always there. So what the rabbis devised with this story is that Abraham was so hyper-focused on his mission of taking his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah as a sacrifice, he didn't look around, right? There's a difference between a small, cuddly little sheep and a thousand-pound ram. You can miss a sheep. You can't miss a ram. So the rabbis understood the story as if Abraham would have looked around his surroundings, would have seen, he would have known, Isaac was never meant for a sacrifice, right? Right? As that knife gets raised, of course, it is worth mentioning as well that child sacrifice was rampant back then. The moment, and for child sacrifice, those that were, and and forgive the expression, uh, especially as Jews, it's a little Holocaust-laden, those that were undesirable were put to death. Okay, But the moment that Abraham raises the knife, child sacrifice in Judaism stops forever. We never do it again. So, you know, the moral of the story of what they go through, especially with the, the, the second, is for clarity and to be able to open our eyes to the world around us. The first Midrash, I think, is really, really pointed because it shows Abraham's relationship with the father of Islam and the father of Judaism, of Isaac and of Ishmael. That he loves his children, or his two sons, He had six others after. But he loves his children equally, and he loves them. And I think it is a test of this room and many other communities around the globe that have come together to learn about one another and about our faiths. Ishmael and Isaac lay claim to, I don't know, 1.3 billion people, give or take. We're only 16 million, but it's okay. But that's, that. you know, it, there's something really powerful because we don't hear very much about our patriarchs and our matriarchs on a relational basis with their children, right? Many in our Torah study group hear, hear me say this. Our patriarchs and matriarchs were amazing leaders. They were terrible parents. <laughs> don't take parental advice from Moses. Right? You don't hear about the love and, oh, I gave my two sons hugs and kisses. We don't hear that because they had to lead. And when we look at, at, at Abraham and his son Ishmael and of Isaac, especially with that Midrash, there is a lot of love and a lot of – there's a lot of endearment that is given to, to Abraham and his two sons. Thank you. Thank you both. That's one point I forgot. <coughs> one, <coughs> one point to mention on that, from an Islamic perspective, to add to what uh, Rabbi said, we believe that, yes, after Abraham passed that test and we, he got the Ram, which we commemorate every year as a celebration, it's called the Eid al-Adha, 
we have a feast and we commemorate that feast. It's more a celebration feast. It's not a sacrifice, but a celebration. Then when the, the next point is, because Abraham passed the test of willing to sacrifice this one son that God gave him. Remember we talking about the first son. Yes. Then God gave him Isaac. And from Isaac came many, many prophets. And God gave him many, many sons and generations, and became and he became the father of generation. So the willingness to sacrifice one son, which he could have think that he would lose the generations and yes. never have a generation after him, God made him the father of all generations. Of all generations. Thank you. Good statement, Tom. Rabbi Matthew, historically, uh, Judaism has had three so-called pilgrimage festivals during which Jews who could make the journey to the temple in Jerusalem were commanded to do so. In fact, the Christian scriptures often refer to Jesus himself making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate those festivals. We've already mentioned two of them, Sukkot and Passover, and you're going to say a word about Passover to clear up an error that I made last week. The third pilgrimage festival is called Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. So Rabbi, fill us in about uh, my mistake with Passover, the Seder, and about the third pilgrimage festival. All right, so I'm going to condense around 4,000 years of Jewish history in about 33 seconds. Otherwise, I cut him off. Otherwise, I get cut off. Uh, just to go uh, with, uh, with Darcy, with, with, with the last points that you made, um, we, we talked last week about Jesus' Last Supper and it being a Passover Seder, the Seder element in terms of the organization, the structure, how we as Jews perform our um, order of our Seder meal, that was created 300 years after Jesus. If we're talking about a festive meal that Jesus ate, it probably most likely was a Passover meal, it just was not a structured Seder, because that occurs 300 years later. Uh, and part of our proof text that we have from it is what we call the Haggadah, which is what we read from. Um, it doesn't talk about uh, the times of Jesus or the era itself. It talks about cities like B'nai Brak, mm -hmm. the rabbis, which was uh, early rabbinic literature around two to 300 um, of the common era. So it, it was many years after. Um, and to go back on, on, on your one point about our three pilgrim festivals. These are all biblically mandated. Okay, so all comes from the Torah. We call them the Shalosh Regalim. Chad, Shtaim, Shalosh, three. Regel, in Hebrew, are my legs. It's a three-legged festival. What does it mean? You use your legs and you walk. Right? You walk to Jerusalem. And that's where these pilgrim festivals, you would bring the best of what you had, and you would make holy pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year. As we mentioned last week, right, if we go in sequential order of the months of the year, um, the month of Nisan, which is when Passover occurs, that's the first Hebrew month. So Passover, which we discussed last week, 49 days later, right, seven weeks, we get a holiday called Shavuot. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, briefly in just one second. Those are 49 days on the 50th day we commemorate with um, a holiday of Shavuot. After Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we get a holiday of Sukkot, seven days, right? Um, where we live in temporary booths, we live in huts, Sukkot. Shavuot is the time at which we received the Torah. Shavuot is a time at which we received the Ten Commandments. Um, so it is a joyful holiday. It is a very meaningful one. Traditionally, just to bring it back to food, Right? There's a lot of foods that we eat. They are predominantly dairy. Blinces. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the French made it better with crepes, but um, we eat blinces, right? Fill it with cheese or whatever um, other accoutrement that, that, that you have, ice cream. Very much a dairy, uh, a dairy holiday. Um, but we, it is commemorated with or, or understood as the time at which we received our law, the time at which we received the Torah. And if you look at it historically, if we can, Passover from slavery towards liberation being free 
we cross over, or pass over, I should say, um, um, the sea, the Sea of Reeds. God parts it, and we go into dry land. And then for 49 days, we are really just waiting, almost like this, this holding pattern. We wait for God to give us the Ten Commandments and to give us uh, the Torah. And at some people call it a Pentecost festival, meaning 50 days, not to be confused with the Christian Pentecost. Well, it's at the same time, absolutely. Um, for the Christian, it means the coming of the Holy Spirit. But it does happen at the very same time, 50 days after the Passover. I should, I should also mention as well with, with Shavuot, traditionally, um, and for those that have heard the term confirmation, I don't know if people have heard the term confirmation in a Jewish context, not the same as in a Christian context. Confirmation was created um, by and large uh, by a bunch of women in New York City in 1850. And what they noticed was that when their sons became bar mitzvahs, because of course bat mitzvah did not exist back then, when their sons became bar mitzvah, there was no further Jewish education that was given to their sons. So they started a program in Temple Emanuel and Fifth Avenue in New York City called Confirmation to encourage our kids to stay in the program. Many synagogues offer Confirmation, the culmination of, of Confirmation on Shavuot because it is a reconfirming of our faith and our devotion towards Torah, towards the Ten Commandments, and towards God. Good point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was so succinct. I, Rabbi. I, I've been practicing. I've been practicing. <laughs> so now we can move on to the real topic for today's session, which is to consider how contemporary culture, social trends over, say, the last 50 years, have modified the interpretation of the scriptures that we've been talking about for two weeks, these rules governing food and festivals, drink and fasting and so forth. Here in America, as we said in our first segment, our culture has become increasingly individualistic. And the rise of social media has meant that people tend to isolate themselves and stick to their own tribe, people who think like they do. That same media-driven culture seems to feed into our need to be constantly distracted and constantly entertained. Pastor Gore, I know that this is going to be a huge question, but trying to look at it from 35,000 feet, the larger perspective, how have these cultural changes, individualism, isolating, tribalism, need to be distracted and entertained, how have they affected the Pentecostal church? And if you want to just give up and say, Darcy, that's way too big. <laughs> now, praise God. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in this. Uh, uh, for instance, we have what we call mothers in the church. And I'm pretty much speaking toward all African-American churches. They're not very much different than that. The, one of the biggest difference with the Pentecostal is that we only have one book, and that's the Bible. We don't have hymn books or anything of that nature. We just have a Bible, and we believe in that. We believe in preaching from the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe in. But yes, our dress code have really changed a lot. Uh, our hairstyles have really changed a lot. And if you sit on the front seat of uh, the church, automatically we have something we call throw cloth. If your dress is short, they're gonna somebody's gonna come up and throw a cloth across your lap. <laughs> you like that, huh? <laughs> there you go. So the preacher could preach. And uh, so the preacher can preach. So the preacher can <laughs> preach, <laughs> not be distracted. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we believe in that the women should have their head covered uh, because we believe in men should not have their head covered because uh, God is our head covering, and the man is the covering of the woman, his wife. So she should have her head covered when she's worshiping God. And so, yes, the. Uh, it have, it have changed quite a bit uh, to accept these new ones coming in. 
And one of the biggest reasons is that we got this modern technology mm -hmm. that we as elderly people don't know anything about it. But the younger people can come in and crank them up and get them going with, with, with you know, no problem. Is that w what actually is happening in the Pentecostal church? Do young people demand entertainment and, and music and so forth, a, a band kind of thing? Or you don't have hymn books. How do you teach the young people anything? Well, iron shop and iron. And they can draw one another with no problem because of the things they do. They even have praise dances now. I don't, I don't agree with a lot of this stuff, but this fills the church up. This helps educate the kids. And they talk about it. They take it back to school with them. And okay. it draws a crowd. So... Uh, yes, it have changed. It, it have changed. changed. Well, I'm going to turn to Father Christian and get the Episcopalian take on it. How have things changed? And I know it's a huge question, uh, but if you can attempt it, I'd appreciate it. I don't remember me having that question in the notes. Think on your feet. Okay. <laughs> and but you want it more engaged to like. This, the context of breaking bread, yeah? Or just the isolationism, and I think it, it's something we're all struggling with in any institution. Uh, we talked about this before, Rabbi and I, in previous ones with you, Darcy, how uh, people bowl alone now. <laughs> uh, that never used to happen. Uh, people just go to a bowling alley. You always be part of a league. Uh, golf memberships are down. And so people now go and join Elks Lodge. Those are becoming a thing of the past. So the idea of community is a thing of the past, and so the church is desperately trying to say, and I would say the temple, the mosque, of we do community. Let's, there's, there's, it's so important. God's calling us to break bread together. So yes, I think like any other institution, the Episcopal Church is definitely feeling that. Uh, and um, the question is also uh, not what can I do for this spiritual community, but what can the spiritual community do for me? Mm. Uh, and so that's the biggest question I would think for the church to move forward is that now since we're more an individualistic culture, uh, the, the, the greatest generation, I, I tip my hat to you because uh, that, that culture from the greatest generation was go and serve your institutions and make this society better, make civilization better, that's our responsibility. Now it's flipped to say, how can we sell you how we can make your life better? Mm. <laughs> and then hopefully in that you will buy into a groupistic mentality and it's the group and the community that's first and uh, like there's a prayer attributed to St. Francis that you know, it's, it's when we uh, offer our life, we can find our life. When we die, we are born into new life. So when we offer our individualistic self to the greater good, that's when we find life. And so it, it is, it is a, a, a tension, a healthy tension, sometimes uh, an unhealthy tension. How do you attract the spiritual community by focusing on this, what we think a very groupistic, collectivist way that God calls us to be, a very selfless one, where people are more looking more now for uh, individualistic needs uh, and that's why we see things like the prosperity gospel flourishes because that is preaching all you need to do is offer something and you will be blessed you will get money you will get good health so it's about you 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 uh, we see that as a plague upon modern music as well that a lot of modern Christian music is a lot of I statements it's about my relationship with Jesus well the old hymns it's we statements and it's about God you see a lot of modern hymn, hymnody is about me, I, and what I get from my salvation and that I was my personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which is nowhere found in the Bible. That's a very modern saying that came out of the, came out of the 90s. So, yeah, so we're, we're struggling. But I think that once people get a taste of the group, of the community, mm -hmm. and since people are so alone, especially the pandemic, what it gave us was it, it, it taught us that hunger we have. And we had to campaign our bishop please open the doors of the church. We have people who are suicidal, who are depressed, who are lost and alone. If they don't have their church community, it's not good. And above all the science, that's what got him to open up our doors because he realized we can't do this alone. We have to have our community, all of us, uh, not just the church, but all of us. Uh, and so I think that's the cell. I hate to say the cell, but I think that's the cell. The community is, is everything. And as you pointed out, COVID also made it a lot easier for people to stay home and just tune in on a live stream service. And they forgot about the joy of being with one another. So that 
militated against that. Um, when we were talking about Holy Communion last week, uh, Pastor Gore mentioned that generally in the Pentecostal church, they only observe it once a month, which it would seem to me would make it a very impactful Sunday, a red letter day. And you were explaining last week that in the Episcopal tradition in recent years, there's been a much greater emphasis on the Lord's Supper, and communion services happen at least once a week, if not more. Now, when did that start to happen, and why do you think those changes occurred? In the Episcopal Church, and if you come from a liturgical background, so you, we went to Shabbat service last week. You have, you have a guide, the liturgy. I, I don't know how often that changes and how often they create new ones. And uh, if at the mosque, you have the same thing. There's a, for us, it's the Book of Common Prayer. So the, the, the previous one was from 1928. And so every time we get a new prayer book, it's a real big deal in the Episcopal Church. It, it, it reflects the movement of theology and the changing of how we think on God and see God in our life it's in, the, in the church. So when we moved from the 1928 prayer book to the last change, which was 1979, there was a movement to move away from just us focusing on prayer and the word of God, which are very good things, to more focusing upon the feast of God, that the central part of who we are as Christians, as Episcopalians, is the Holy Communion. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the center of everything. So before we would gather, we would do morning prayer, the 1928 prayer book. Now, as a church, we're saying no. The cornerstone of everything we do is the breaking bread. It's a cornerstone. It's us coming together to break bread and come to this altar that what we talked about last time we were here, the Lamb of God is placed upon the cross who takes away all the sins of the world. Our Passover meal, the way we see the Passover meal, that's the cornerstone. So everything in that book drives to that, um, and that's what brings us together, which brings in, of course, the. if you look at all of Jesus' famous, he did a lot of miracles. The ones that people talk about are the ones that involve food, the feeding of the 5,000. Yay, he cured a kid. He resurrected some dead people, but he fed 5,000 people. You know, one of his most famous miracles is the wedding at Cana. That's why uh, marriage is a, is a sacrament. It's a holy sacrament because his first miracle was done at the wedding at Cana. What, what, was, that, what was that miracle? Water into wine. Turning water into wine. That's what people talk about. Not the epileptic kid that he healed. <laughs> Not the child he raised from the dead. People are really concerned about the food, you know? What, that's what gets us, right? So that is the cornerstone, is the holy meal that becomes the center of our life now as Episcopalians. So you would say that having it with much greater frequency doesn't diminish its impact. Uh, it, it increases the fervor of the faithful. Yes, and for all my Catholics out there, so there's a Catholicity that's involved in that way of looking at the holy meal um, that... <laughs> We become much more sacramental now as Episcopalians as opposed to focusing on the word. So all for my non-Christians, when you walk inside a church, you can always tell what's the most important thing by the architecture. If you see a small little altar, that means, yeah, it's the holy meal, the communion, all right. And you, but if you see a big, a big preaching area uh, or a big lectern, that means they believe wholeheartedly that's what's important, the Bible, the word, that's what's leading. Episcopalians try to be like, Maybe we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, but the <laughs> night, but the book of, uh, that's what we always like to say about everything. We're somewhere in the middle, you know? We're the via media. Uh, but the 79 prayer book definitely does make a statement more. It says, no, actually, we're led by this holy meal, the sacrament. So we become much more sacramental. And it brings together people as the body of Christ. Amen. All right. Both for you, Pastor Gore, and Father Christian, has there been a movement that you're aware of to allow non-believers to partake of the communion? In other words, practice open table, or is that not happening? Pastor Gore? Well, yes, because of, uh, yes, you know. Well, we have a reading before the Holy Communion. This is the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed for many. And then we need to make our holy confession. And I think we should confess. I should confess about two or three times a day, especially if somebody pull out in front of me. <laughs> you know, so, so this is, the more we have it, I think it enhances our congregation. Uh, my staff is, we do something different every Sunday. So that's why the first Sunday is set aside to dress the place up just for that. 
So, but they have to repent. We ask them to repent first. And this is a new beginning. So this you're is saying a new beginning. that a non-believer is welcome, that he yes, or she can read. confess and then partake. That's correct, yeah, because every man should judge himself. I can't judge him. Can I, can I, can I, get, can I get risque here can, or controversial? If Rabbi yeah. Durbin came, would that be okay or would it be weird? Oh, no, it'd be fine. Huh? It'd be fine. I'm just saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. As long as he confesses to himself whatever his sins may be, and he's not going to do them anymore, and he most grievously, I love making him nervous. He most grievously, <laughs> sorry for his misdoing, through word, thoughts, and deeds, whatever he did. Because we believe in whatever you think it, so you do. Okay. All right, and in. <laughs> yeah, you cross your yeah. arms. Just That's cross right. your arms. You ask for a blessing. Wakanda forever. And. Open table in the Episcopal Church? Very controversial. <laughs> well, for church geeks, it's controversial. Uh, I, 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 but y <laughs> yeah, it's a controversial topic in the church. Is everyone accepted to the holy meal, to communion? Is everyone invited to break bread? So if you're not baptized as a Christian, your way of saying, I'm in, I want to follow Jesus, uh, are you invited? So there's one way to look at it and say, listen, everyone's invited to the table. And you, if, if, you, if you exclude someone, so imagine if I invite one of you to St. Mary's, come on, you're like, okay, I'll go, Father Christian, that sounds great. And for whatever reason, you feel called to take this bread and take this wine, and then someone calls you on your Episcopal card and says, hey, <laughs> where's your card? <laughs> are, are you, are, do you really believe? Have you been baptized? And you're like, no, I haven't been baptized. I'm curious, though. And they say, well, do you just sit here while we all go up there? Will you come back? I don't know. So that's one theory of saying everyone's invited. Like WWJD, like the great bumper sticker that I'm sure we all adore. What would Jesus do? Uh, would, would everyone be invited? Uh, and then there's other people saying, well, no, we need to grow. We need formation. And sure, everyone's invited, but we also need to know how, what the sacred meal means. We need to be baptized. Some would say you need a first communion, you need formation. Uh, and, and I think that the church has allowed each respective place. My boss is here. He might correct me after this. But uh, from what I understand, the, the, the big church has said, uh, has allowed each church to make their own decision on that and not butt in the way. No? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. got, thumbs up. got the thumbs up. From <laughs> Still the got a job. Epic. Well, polls have been telling us, polls with two L's, uh, that organized religion, in quotes, is falling out of favor. At least that seems to be true for mainline Christian churches. And yet, what I've been hearing from the Sheikh and the rabbi over the last two weeks is that it's the very rules and rituals that organize their faith that act as a kind of sacred glue uh, that holds it all together, that unites people as a community or a family. Now that strikes me as being very countercultural in a healthy way, moving against the tide of individualism. But I don't know if that's just my sort of rose-tinted glasses impression Rabbi, have you observed a desire to move away from observing the strict rules and rituals, special meals that have historically been such an important part of the Jewish faith, a move to reform more? Or is there a trend in the opposite direction toward greater orthodoxy? Oh, I didn't know it would cause such pain. No, it's, it's, it's not the pain. It's, 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 there's so much in the history. Okay, because I, I, I do have to Rabbi say. Rabbi always prefaces his remarks that way, and that's a way to get away with saying a whole lot. Yes. Time. So, so just, just to kind of um, go through a little bit of history from an organized religion, Reform Judaism came first. We were the first centralized religious, Jewish religious movement that comes out of Germany in the 1800s. As a reaction mm. to Reform Judaism spawned Orthodoxy, okay? Out of Orthodoxy came trying to find the middle ground of conservative Judaism and then in America of Reconstructionist. In its early days, the early Reform movement was always based around values and ethics, okay? Um, we were always told in some way uh, the liturgy, what we, what we do with services and how we pray, God hears all languages you speak in the vernacular that you are most accustomed to. So, Father Anderson, like you, have had multiple editions of prayer books. Uh, every 40 years, we do the same. Hmm. Um, 
have one from 2007, which is our current prayer book. We have one from 1976. We got one from 1929, and so on and so forth. But if you go back to previous prayer books, majority of it was all written in English. There was very little in Hebrew. And actually, what the reform movement had done, and certainly over the last 30, 40 years, is a coming back to more tradition, right? Um, <clears throat> the value and ethic-driven mentality was always very strong with, at least in this context, the American reform movement. However, it also have to put it in perspective that the American reform movement was also based in some way, form, or fashion on assimilation, okay? because of fear. Mm. Look what happened to our brothers and sisters in Russia, Ukraine, pogroms. We were murdered because we were Jews. We go to this new land called America. <coughs> if we ruffle too many feathers, we could be next. So there was a great push for assimilation. Um, some early reform rabbis actually wanted to change our Shabbat to Sunday. They wanted to do away with circumcision. They, there was a whole bunch of stuff that never actually uh, materialized. But there was that, that, that really real, real fear. Mm. So assimilation was really big in the reform movement. Once we really established ourselves in this country, I think the reform movement had a resurgence back mm. towards embracing more tradition, right? Go to any of our services, which you are more than welcome to join us for. Um, you'll see 60, 70 percent is in Hebrew, 30 percent or so uh, is in English, but it's, it's, it's all music. It, it's coming together. And I think that we see that in each way, but I should also preface by saying that each synagogue, each reform synagogue, which is around 900 in North America, 950 in North America, are, although housed under a reform movement, they are all autonomous in their organization. So we are very different here than you would find at, say, Temple, I don't know, Temple Betham in Miami or, um, um, you know, uh, synagogue in Los Angeles or Chicago. It would be very different, but we're still housed under the same. Under the same. That was impressively brief. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can go more. <laughs> she sent out well an done. email to all well of done. us and said, warning, warning. I will cut you off this time. The first couple sessions, That's I want a I moment. Be led. Uh, we need some healing. I just thought we needed a little order. <laughs> to the Sheikh, the same question for you in modern day Islam, especially in the Sunni <coughs> branch. Uh, do you see a trend to move away from the old rules and traditions or towards stricter regulation? Uh, so. This is a little different to Judaism and Christianity now, yeah. Uh, and I suppose Orthodox Judaism and Christianity, it will be the same. I, I, I'm just assuming. But in Islam, there is nothing like Orthodox and Reform like you have in Judaism. Uh, what we do, what we have is, and maybe there are similarities, and that's why, you know, I enjoy coming here. You know, my wife was asking me this morning. I mean, we all are going, you going up there again? Again? <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> then the next question, are they paying you to come up there? I'm like, listen, this is a learning process for me. I'm being very honest with you. you know, I love to sit down and learn because it's so, and I'm sitting here thinking, Rabbi, that I must run a monthly show, on, um, I, I'm just going beyond your time, on a monthly program I show on all these commonalities, whether it be circumcision, whether it be dress code, because I think it's so educational for the world than just two of us, few of us here. I really would love to do that. So <laughs> that was just off the record, and I hope I don't get caught off with time with that. <laughs> but no. because it's so educational for me, I really love it. And I want to do that for the world and record it and send it out, and we do it. But anyhow, so we don't really have orthodox and, and reform or uh, things like that. We have something in Islam called faruz. These are terminology, like wajib. Sunnah, Mustahab. What does that mean? Certain things are obligatory. Certain things are between optional and obligatory. Certain things were practiced by the Prophet, peace be upon him. Certain things he recommended. 
and certain things are optional. Mm. Coming to your line of question. So what our scholars do, we don't break off in different groups and organizations and mosques. We're not supposed to. We don't have anything like that. Even though people do it. Uh. Get my point? So I, I, I want to make sure I cover that. Mm. Even though there are people who do it. But officially they cannot do it because they will be going against the teachings of Islam. Mm. They should not come and say, well, this is a reformed mosque or this is a modern day mosque and this is a traditional mosque. Mm. But people do it. Some do it, but not officially. What they do there are certain things in the religion that is compulsory. So there are those people who will practice that. Mm -hmm. Now they are not, there, no, but nobody cannot stay away from what is compulsory. They may not be able to observe it, but they cannot say, we're going to open a mosque that does not practice what is obligatory. But then you have a group, you got another fact that is optional. Like for example, the beard. Mm. No way in the Quran tells you that you must wear a beard. Mm. Very interesting. But you look around the Muslim world, one of the things you know a Muslim is a long beard. But it is not in the Quran that you must do that. Mm. Circumcision. While in Judaism it may be obligatory in some aspects, I don't know, or some belief. A lot of Mus Muslims in the world believe that circumcision is like Judaism. You've got to do it as soon as the child is born. Not knowing that the Quran does not speak about it. Mm. But it's a major practice in Islam. If, if a Muslim, some Muslims think if you're not circumcised, you're not Muslim. <laughs> uh, just, so it's a misconception. But what, is, what we see happening in the modern world is that there are a lot of people now, because the Quran doesn't talk about beard, they choose not to wear a beard. You see how they modernize things, but it's not going away. They got the choice. Dress code. There are some who, they're wearing that the prophet, peace be upon him, wore like Jesus and Moses and Abraham. There are some people who say, well, that was the wearing dress code of the prophet and the prophet. So we hold on to that. We don't do otherwise. Mm. So what we have is not a reform or an orthodox. We s some people say it, but it, from a real educational point of view, it, no. There are those now who will be flexible in taking what is obligatory, they hold on to that, and they say, well, I don't need to wear the, 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 the long gown. I can wear a jacket and suit. I can, yeah. So do you know there are people who come to mosque with a short pants? Because it's permissible that you can pray with your pants covering the knees. Mm -hmm. Above that, you cannot. So some men, not so ladies. you don't have these cloths like No, no. So the men, some men will do that. Ladies got to cover. Some ladies say, well, we're in a modern world. That's why all Muslim women don't cover their heads. So it's the so individualism it's is They, they choose you. whichever is permissible, On flexible. And you'll find a mixture of Muslims all over the world. That's what you see. All right. Now I'd like to begin talking with you all about Shabbat, <coughs> or the Sabbath. When Rabbi was describing last week the weekly observance of Shabbat, it sounded like such a wonderful institution for keeping a family together, focusing on things that matter around the table. Rabbi, as far as you know, is the family gathering on Shabbat something that's being kept with the same regularity as in the past, or has secular culture affected that? <laughs> so I, I would say, I, I, I think, Darcy, in, in, in some way, I think it's a bit of both. Mm. Um, Shabbat is a gift. Shabbat has always been a home celebration. It is bringing of family and friends together to share a meal, to bless the food. But really, when you look at it, what are we really blessing? We're acknowledging God. Thank you, God. Right? Shabbat, we are told, is an opportunity for us to make that day sacred and holy. There's a difference between making it special and holy. So we define the holiness by invoking God. Right? We have a tradition of blessing our children on Friday nights. It's taken almost 12 years, but now my 12-year-old will allow me to put my hands on her head. <laughs> they resisted for a long time. But it, 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 it has been that. If we, if we look back at, um, this is done a few years ago, at a Pew study. The Pew study was done amongst the Jewish people of looking at observances, um, ideology, uh, feelings, this, that, and the other. And we saw that everything was on a decline. 
right? Synagogue affiliation, synagogue membership on the decline. Um, the observance of Shabbat on the decline, mm. right? The only thing that actually remained constant was the observance of Passover. It's the one thing that whether we were non-observant Jews at all, Passover was always observed, or at least the first day of Passover was always observed. Um, and I think, I think Shabbat gives us the opportunity in two different ways. One is in our own home, ushering God into our home, into our thoughts, and being able to engage with one another. The other is community, right? As you mentioned, COVID was a really big culture shock for us. Mm. And not us as Jews, but us as Jews of Temple Beit Hayam. We, unlike St. Mary's, where you have streamed services to your community for a while, we hadn't. So we had to pivot to be able to purchase cameras, figure out, thank you, Carl, figure out everything on how we could broadcast to our community. That changed the makeup of how we access and become part of community. Mm. We also recognize, as I'm sure all of us do, right, streaming those services for those who don't feel comfortable driving at night, those that are infirm, those that are in hospitals, this, that, and the other, it made it more accessible. It's not the same like being in person, right? And I think with Shabbat, there is something about the feeling of Shabbat that is really, really just impactful. Mm -hmm. We have what we call in our service, I just want to just end with this because I think it's actually really beautiful. We have certain core prayers before we formally start a service. And some of our services on Friday nights are called Kabbalat Shabbat, the receiving of Shabbat, bringing Shabbat in, which is really doing it through music and through song. One of the songs we sing is a prayer called Shalom Aleichem. Right? Shalom Aleichem, peace unto you. Shalom Aleichem, right? But the understanding, because this was created in the Kabbalistic era, which would be Kabbalistic is the mystical aspects behind Judaism, largely around the 16th century, is that a 16th century sage actually uses this, creates this prayer, actually creates his name in it, but the understanding of uh, Shalom Aleichem is that when you enter into a sacred place like a synagogue, that two angels accompany you. And when you leave to go back to your respective homes, two angels follow you for your protection. For Shabbat is a safe space and a protectorate. Just really, I know I'm missing a lot because Shabbat is like, Big deal. It's big. <laughs> it's big. Thank you. Jake, you were talking about Shabbat last week, uh, Thursday to Friday, but it doesn't revolve so much around meals as far as I understand. It's community prayer. Yeah. Has that changed because of secular culture, or is that being maintained very much as always? It has been maintained, and uh, as Rabbi said, you know, I like to refle reflect back to Rabbi. We did. We do have some people who came up with recommendations. Can we change it to a Sunday? <laughs> uh, really? But yeah, yeah, yeah. You have those things. But it has never, and the Muslim world don't think about that because, again, like Judaism, our Sabbath, which is on Friday, it's the main day of the week. The main day of the week. It's community. Actually, the prayer cannot be done individually. Mm -hmm. It has to be with a congregation. Some jurisprudence in Islam says you gotta have a minimum of three people to do the basic prayer. Mm. Well, the leader, the pastor, or the imam, and that. Otherwise, there's n uh, three is considered a congregation. And this is just on Shabbat. Yeah, for that prayer, for that prayer. Yeah. There are some other teachings that say it gotta be minimum 40 people. But it's all about a community. That's why it's called Juma. Juma in Arabic comes from an Arabic word, Jama'a, meaning congregation. Uh. So Sabbath is all about congregation. And something important for you all to know about our Sabbath, because it's not, our, food comes in, not at, but it's not part of it. Mm. You pray, you read the Quran, you give charity, you do every good thing you can do. You invite people and eat, that is also charitable. So it is also part, but it's not a condition. But something important for us to know about our, the, the, the Islamic Juma or Sabbath, it's on a Friday. So some people ask, why is it on a Friday? We were taught that Moses saved the Israelites 
on a Friday. The ocean opened and God opened it on a Friday. We were taught that, that Jesus was saved from the cross on a Friday. Very interesting to understand. Mm. Very interesting theological topic. You know, G Christians believe that, that Jesus died for their sins. Well, we believe that he was saved on a Friday. He didn't die. He was lifted not from the grave, but bodily on that Friday. So it's our holy day. So when, we, when Christians say it's a good Friday, we say it's a good Friday that Jesus was saved. Mm. Christians say it's a good Friday that it, he died for their salvation. But you see the theological technical. So that's why this Friday, is, and as Rabbi again said, it is big for us. We believe the day of judgment will come on a Friday. We believe that Adam was created on a Friday. There's so many things about uh, the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. The, yes. They, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank God it's Friday. So, the, so our Friday is like very big. Everything you can think about religiously, we are recommended to do on that day. But community, that's why the name is Jama. Gathering. You need to encourage gathering. That's why they, they pray for us, Rabbi, on, on, on the pandemic. was big for us. People, there were some, there were many a mosque that never shut down. Because they said there is no mosque if people don't congregate. Yeah, thank you. It's so funny because we, Darcy, we say TJIS. <coughs> thank God it's Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> Good rejoinder. <laughs> Pastor Gore, traditionally, uh, the Christian Sunday Sabbath was observed by going to church and Sunday school, and often, although this wasn't mandated, um, you had a big Sunday dinner. Is that still happening? I mean, we used to have roast preachers on that day. <laughs> I don't know if that's still happening or not. So, first of all, think of integration. Integration. Okay. Uh, now you well, we didn't have. We had restaurants in our communities, but uh, now since integration, we can eat anywhere we want to eat. So I'm I'm warning you at 1:30 on Sunday. Whatever restaurant you go, you're going to see the best red dressed people in the world <laughs> sitting there eating. <laughs> so we don't have to do it at the church no more. We don't have to do the dinner on the yard no more because we can go wherever we want and eat. Yes, it is. We meet other churches at certain places. We go to Southern Pig. We go down to Red Lobster. We, we fellowship. We fellowship. So that's what the reason why we had it at the church. It was safer. Mm-hmm. And everybody bought uh, a dish, and the kids ran and played, uh -huh. and it was a pleasant day all day because we didn't cook anything on Sunday. That was a holy day. But we did it all the way up to 12 o'clock on Saturday night, mm. and then we took all our dishes in. So, yes, it still is. And I think on the fourth Sunday, I take the kids to the causeway out there. I think Father Christian was out there with us, and, uh, and we let our hair down, and they play in the water, and we enjoy ourselves. The kids love it. Yes, it still is a tradition, but we, you know, we can go where we want to go now. Gotcha. Yeah. Father Christian, uh, what about in the Episcopal tradition? Sunday dinner? Does that happen? I know you kind of enjoy Sunday brunch. <laughs> yeah, it's what a flag what you were saying. So the, the meal at a church for the, the black church culture, uh, that became embedded because of segregation. There was not a safe place to go. Safety. Yeah. Do and it that's the only church. place you could eat. Because of segregation, you couldn't eat at the restaurant, so the church became the safe home. Uh, we call there are seven sacraments in the Episcopal Church. I won't quiz you on them now, but we do for our confirmation class. I don't know if we stole that term from you too. We stole a lot from you. <laughs> um, but the eighth sacrament is uh, for the Episcopalian. Uh, that the Kimes are here, who they love very much. Coffee. Um, and, and so uh, our, our coffee hour is the big thing for Episcopalians. So I think our culture is more or less, if, if you have a rock and coffee hour, uh, you're going to build community. Uh, and so we, um, so at St. Mary's, we actually, have one of our parishioners it owns uh, Gilbert's, and, and their offering to the church are the coffee beans. And I'll tell you, that makes a difference, because if the coffee's not good, people ain't sticking around. Um, and so I think that really helps with our culture because if there is not a good coffee hour and if you don't have competitive, we, we got uh, some, some competitive coffee hour hosts now. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's, it's a wonderful problem to have because people stick around. But if you're just putting out some Wawa donuts, 
with some leftover coffee from the AA meeting last night, either you're going to have no community, all right? And then if we really want to shake hands with the devil, we'll offer mimosas. If we got to talk about business and have our community there to talk about the budget, we'll say there's mimosas. And of course, we will offer NA stuff there, um, but it, that, that's a, a key part. So I think the idea of a fit, sure, once upon a time, I think it just matched in American culture that you would always have a meal. And I just remember growing up, and we've talked about this before in this venue, that when I, when I grew up, Sundays were so sacred. That was such a big family because I grew up in Chicago. And uh, I was on, my sister and I were on traveling soccer teams. And right when we got into our teens is when they started putting traveling soccer games on Sunday. And it was very taboo mm. at the time mm. that they would put a traveling soccer game on Sunday. Uh, and and it would, you could tell it was hurt. It, it, it hurt people because it was like this is, they could feel it coming. Um, and it was because it was not being stopped. And here we are. We're probably our biggest, I would say our biggest, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this. Our biggest enemy is not, this, it's not Satan. It's like lacrosse tournaments. <laughs> it's, it's like <laughs> basketball tournaments. Of course it's Satan. But I'm just saying, like, dude, get people to celebrate community. Uh, you know, our kids are just all over the country. And in Flo Florida, sports are so big. Um, it's it, that's that's it's hard to get that dinner with your family, whether that is your just your biological family or your church family, because you have such competition now from from heavy programming. And not just sports, but I mean, since all stores are now open, mm -hmm. uh, you know, throughout Sunday, uh, the opportunity to just be a good consumer is before us as well. So people can go shopping to the mall, do all kinds of things. Um, Next week, we're going to be getting very personal with these guys. We're going to find out what they do in their own homes, their own practices. Uh, so be thinking of questions that you might want to be posing to them. Uh, for now, do we have time for some questions from the floor? Uh, I don't know exactly how we're going to do this. We're going to have our temple president or f former president. Do they always call you president for life? Do you get, do you get private security, all that stuff with it? You have a tattoo <laughs> for life, okay. G so let, let's give him a wireless uh, mic. I think uh, Pastor Gore, can, can he use it and then you'll use rabbis. So I think uh, Darcy's gonna give us some direction on this because uh, let, let, let's yeah. not go south with these yeah. questions. Let's stay on top of it. We're still living in a pretty tense moment, so uh, we aren't going to do politics and we aren't going to talk about the Middle East right now. We're going to try to stick to what we've been covering the last few weeks, which are the traditions uh, within our different faiths. I'd like to know about the attitude toward women in the Muslim church. That's a big one. <laughs> oh, shake. That, yeah, five, five minutes. Yeah, that, that's a big one, that's a big one. But just to cut it short, um, there is a misconception. Let me answer with the misconception because I think that's why w the question comes up. There is a misconception that women in Islam are really oppressed and women in Islam are being treated badly. But it's just the opposite. Some people think that the dress code of women in Islam, it's an oppression. No, it's an Abrahamic thing. If you look at Jesus of Nazareth, you look at all the biblical movies, all the very, all the very Moses and Ten Commandments, the very same dress code of the women in those days happens to be the dress code of the Muslim. You look at a Christian nun, what is her dress code? The dress code of a Muslim woman. So that's definitely, it's an Abrahamic thing. Even all our gown and wear and hair and long hair and beard, it's all an Abrahamic thing. So let's rule that out. The dress code is not an oppression that was designed by Muslim men. It, it is an Abrahamic thing, number one. Number two, in Islam, women have more rights than men. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm answering the easy thing just so you get an idea why I say they're not oppressed and that's where. No, let me, let me bring the other part. Uh, the reason why these questions come up. In some cultures, and mm. to be very clear, mm. places like India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, unfortunately, they have a lot of cultures. And maybe in other parts in the Arab world and all these things, because of their culture, the men sort of take advantage of women. But that's a man culture thing, not Islam. Not Islam at all. Actually, Islam tells us that when the prophet, peace be upon him, started preaching the message of Islam, the people who did not accept Islam said that he was, that women were ruling men. 
Because he taught men how to be humble and loving to your wives. Mm. You see what I'm saying? But before that, the men were very, very, very dictatorial. And, but when Islam came by, the women used to talk more. They used to dictate the, 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 the show at the home. Because that is what Islam taught. It's culture that tells you this. Um, in Islam, a, wo a, a, a woman, as a daughter, she inherits from her father's wealth when he dies. When she becomes a wife, she has to inherit. These are the laws. She inherits from her husband when he dies. When she becomes a mother, if her son dies, she inherits from his property and his wealth. Meaning the law is she's supposed to give him a share of his wealth as a mother. It's not like the daughter-in-law says, you go up the road. You are just the mother-in-law. I'm in charge. No, 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 no. So three ways she get the money and the wealth. The man, the poor guy, he got to give it in all ways. He gives it as a husband. He gives it as a father. He gives it as a son. So if she financially runs the show, is that oppression? She controls everything. Y you see the point I'm trying to get at? So it's just a misconception, unfortunately, with the culture. And I agree. There are people who do otherwise because it's a cultural thing. But in Islam, not at all. And one other point. In Islam, when a man gets married, his wife does not have the right to do... She has... N it's not uh, compulsory on her to do anything. She can sleep on a bed like a queen. No work. No cook. No dress. No help in pay the bills. The law is... If you marry a wife as a millionaire, she has no rights to pay your bills. you got to maintain her and pay her bills. Your money is her money, and her money is her money. <laughs> oh, but I'm being honest. You go study the law. That's the law in Islam, but it's just practice otherwise. You go check that out. No way she has to give. If she wants to share her money with the husband and with the children, okay. But she can take all her parents' property that she got. Not a law. Husband cannot divorce her because of that. She does not even have to work to help him pay the bills. She can sleep and just be a princess. How, many, a how many wives may a Muslim man have? That's a harder question. <laughs> 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 but, okay, okay, I see your question, yeah. Stay. The, what if what? What, what if, if she, she doesn't, doesn't want, want to stay? Stay, stay where? Or marry. Oh, she has that choice also. Oh, Islam, you see, Islam has a law that a woman is married and a man, they are married for happiness in this world. This world was not designed to be a hell for them. And if their marriage is not happy, they have the total rights of divorce. She has, and do you know if the husband refuses to give her the divorce, she can go to the rabbi or the imam or the sheikh, I mean, like, you know, and he then listens to her matter and her problem, and he grants her the divorce. That's so much a law is because a lot of men will not want to give the divorce. If he's a king or an emperor or, or he's the president of the country, it will be embarrassing for his wife to leave him. But then the, ju the justice system says, she's not happy with you. Granted divorce. Easy way to answer the, 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 <laughs> the controversial question. Islam, you know, you know, a lot of people do have this problem in Islam. And I always like to share the, 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 ju the just answer. In Islam, Islam limits the amount of wives that a man can have. There is no limit on how many wives David could have had. There's, there was no limit on how many wives Solomon could have had, Prophet Solomon. There's no limit on how many wives they could have had. There was no limit on how many wives Jacob had. All right? Jacob had four wives. He married two sisters. And he married their two maids. The whole concept of Christianity and Judaism came from those 12 sons and that whole progeny. So Islam, a lot of people think that the concept of having more than one wife was born from Islam. No, 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 no. These are all Abrahamic practices. Abraham was the man who had Hagar and, 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 and Sarah. Then he had another wife that he had many more sons with. So Islam actually limited the wives. You see what I'm saying? There's a but limerick that says, King Solomon and King David lived very wicked lives with half a hundred concubines and far too many wives. <laughs> but as old age came crouching near, King Solomon wrote the proverb and David wrote the psalm. <laughs> I like that. That is so sweet. That is so, so basically, basically, it's just that it's propagated a lot of wo wo men, women, wives. But really and truly, this is a very biblical thing that came from the historic days. Islam limited four wives. See what I'm saying? <laughs> a lot of people forget that Jacob had four wives, and the whole thing continued from his sons and the family. That's just an easy way without any controversy. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions?
Mine has nothing to do with anything except breaking bread. And we have been to restaurants where we have seen families just sitting there with their phones, not conversing in any way, shape, or form. And there is something that has to be said for putting your phones away, turning it off, leaving it home, something in order to get families back together. It's true, and you can't eat your phone. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that question. When my wife and I go out to dinner, we leave the phone in the car. It's all about her and me. I actually have two questions. I, I, One I, I, I have a suggestion for that. When you go out for dinner, maybe the wife should take the husband's phone and the husband takes the wife's phone. <laughs> And nobody else come here. <laughs> and, all, and, and the parents, or the kids take the parents' phone and the parents take the kids' phone. All conversation done. Possible. I have two food questions, one for the priest and one for the imam. For the priest, if Jesus was handed a pork sandwich, would he eat it? And if it had cheese on it, would he eat it? And for the imam, I'm not quite sure uh, how they mix che uh, milk and meat, or is it like Judaism? where they took the thread, you should not boil a, a, a lamb in its mother's milk, and stretched it to no cheese with no meat in Islam. You don't have that regulation about mixing dairy and meat. That's not Islamic. That's no, that's right. the, 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 let me ask you to answer quick, then the father will take it over. So as we were saying in one of the program, we don't have a problem with milk and dairy products. but And it's neither obligatory. Remember I told you that the law of what is obligatory optional. So in Islam, it's not obligatory, it's not mandatory, but it was just recommended that when you eat fish, don't drink milk with fish because of a digestion health problem. It's not so much a spiritual thing. That was the only thing, but it's not even mandatory or obligatory. Yeah. yeah, I think Pastor Gore and I are on opposite ends on this one. We revealed the first time. So I would say that, uh, yeah, Jesus was a very good Jew and would have followed the law and not have had the pork. Uh, I, I think my, my learned friend, my brother over here, would disagree and say... Well, this was in, in the context of when he was in a Gentile situation, in a Gentile, uh, Galilee of the Gentiles. Yeah. Would he simply accept what was in front of him? And you said, no, no he would not. He's and mostly Pastor with Jews. Gore he's always with Jews. So I would say he would be following the Jewish law. That would be my take. And Pastor Gore was saying he had the freedom. Well, well Paul said... Uh, wherever he's at, that's what he will respect. Okay, if he's in Rome, he's going to do what the Romans did. But, but he was Paul after but Jesus. It, but if it defiled, Paul is subsequent to If it Jesus. caused Brother Rabbi to stumble, I wouldn't do it. His relationship ruled. Yeah. Right. Other questions? Hajib, is it, is it, yeah. do women, do Muslim women have to wear the headscarf or the hajib? So now, yes, it is, it is Quranic that Muslim women should wear the headscarf. I remember again, I said it has been, and I, I don't know, I think in some other religious cultures, huh, if I'm, I'm too sure, and then these are some of the topics we want, I want to do on our TV show, Rabbi, where I think women, ju women wives uh, and, and Judaism got to wear it, or before marriage, certain so similar, but in Islam, when you reach the age of puberty, it becomes, you know, that bar mitzvah age, when you reach that age, it becomes, that's when it becomes really obligatory. But, 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 it's not such a law that if someone does not do it, it means they're going to go to hell. No. It's all upon the person's faith, mm -hmm. their belief, how very much understanding, how much they practice, how much involved. It's all about that in Islam. You see the point? Because you would look at a, uh, you know, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, she never wore the scarf on her head. And she was the head of the whole Muslim country. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not saying it's not. It is by the book. But again, there are flexibility on people's faith and their belief and how strong they are. Oh, no, 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 no. Again, it, it was about that. that. It, that's the whole thing. B with strange men, that's where the law is. Not with their husband and their children and their immediate family or whatever. It was all about, you know, I mean, unfortunately, uh, the question is interesting, but if you study it, now you realize why so many 
movie stars and movie directors and, and presidents and congressmen get locked up and go to jail because some woman down the road says, he touched her here. Yeah. Maybe if the woman had a head covering, she would not have gone to jail. But anyhow, it was a little security thing for the woman and the attraction and the, the distraction with the opposite sex. Th that's the whole law for this. And it's not about oppression again. It's all about that. That's why it's when there were strange men, this restriction came along. Some laws even say when a woman gets at a certain age and there is no, there is no attraction and affection with the opposite sex, well, the law does not apply. So it, it, it has some technicalities. I mean, uh, you get my point. It just gives, when they're the young or when they're that age, it's all about that and whom they're around. Because the wrong people, it can misrepresent someone's character and the ways. And I mean, let's look at the media. You see all this thing happening all the days. I really don't believe all these men and all these cases you see on the movie about accusation that they're all 100% right. It's all about people use opportunities that damage people character. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So Islam did that as a little precaution security, security. system. Security. One last question. Um, about the multiple Speak lives. into the microphone. Yeah. You guys next. Just, just go right into it. Oh, uh, about the multiple wives. Uh, all at once? Or do you have to divorce <laughs> them one at a time? No, I like, well, just as Solomon, just as Jacob had all four wives together, and Solomon had all, um, all his wives and women at the time, Islam allows it all at once if you want. But the law says if you cannot handle it and you cannot deal justly and you cannot treat them fairly, then stick to one. Very good. So stick to one. It, it, it's funny you mention that because Judaism has the same law. We have always taken multiple wives. I mean, Solomon has a thousand. In around the 8th, 9th century, there was a statement that was put out out of Germany by a rabbi who said it is not acceptable to have more than one wife. That statement actually became law. We don't have more than one wife. However, in the days of the Talmud, so we're talking 16, 1700 years ago, the Talmud made it very clear, you can take as many wives as you want However, each wife must be provided for equally. If she is not, then there are problems, much like in a very um, observant uh, Jewish uh, orthodoxy, for example, the situation in Israel, women cannot file for divorce. Okay? They cannot file for divorce unless three things are not provided for them. Food, shelter, clothing, and sexual relations. If those are not met, a woman can file for divorce. However, if a woman is beaten, that is not grounds for divorce. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed to say this, but this is the, the way the state of Israel operates. is because they operate on what we call the, the, the rabbinutes, the rabbis. Well, the rabbis will say, prove it. How do I know those weren't self-inflicted? Got to prove it. Okay? Mm. The laws hopefully are changing, but in some way, uh, divorce is a very, very difficult, difficult situation. Many may say, especially in the situation in Israel, you know, they don't have equality, and it's not equality between Jew and Muslim or Jew and Christian. It's equality between men and women. There is not full equality. So with the multiple wives, we... We don't take them. Uh, I have enough challenge with one. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it is of that understanding that you need to provide equally for each. And much like with the covering for women, Judaism has the same thing in very traditional communities. Uh, once a woman is married, hair is very sensual. Only one's husband is supposed to be able to touch, to feel, to see. So many Orthodox, well, I shouldn't say many, all Orthodox women either wear wigs, that you would never know the difference between that and normal hair. They wear scarves. But hair is protected, much like women or men, for that matter. If, if, if I met Darcy and I was very traditional and Darcy stuck out her hand, I can't touch your hand, right? Because I'm a married man, right? There's something about those relationships. Uh, we are running out of time. We're over time, actually. So I'm going to call a halt to it. 
Uh, we are meeting next time at St. Mary's. Uh, all of you know where St. Mary's is? Very good. Well, By Cleveland Clinic, Martin, Martin Memorial North, across the street. And so we look forward to seeing you and inviting your questions also of our illustrious panel and how they conduct the, even their married lives. We've heard a little <laughs> about that. <laughs> is Anastasia coming? <laughs> well, a big round of applause to the Temple for hosting us these first three sessions. Thank you so much. Incredible team here. And, um, and then once again, a big shout out to Darcy. She's the, she's the creator of all this. We love her. You're amazing. You deserve 10 husbands, but they don't deserve you. Okay. So we love you so much, and we'll see you guys all next week over at St. Mary's Episcopal Church. God love you.